to see perhaps if we are simply going through life following a form and a routine and a ritual, or are we in reality being as Christian individuals and being as the church all that God would like to see us be? Or are we perhaps forgetting that everything in this world and everything in our lives is essentially not about us at all. It's, it's about Jesus. In fact, everything in this entire world, even beyond ourselves and beyond our church, is about Jesus, and it's always been about Jesus because he was before the world was. And we began on, in the first service with a message entitled A Beautiful Journey, which was simply a reflection on my Christian life that hope that hopefully caused each of those of you who were here for that message to reflect on your own life in Christ that brought you up to this moment in time and how we grew spiritually parallel to the way we grow physically in steps and stages. And uh, it was simply a time of reflection uh, on our lives in Christ that brought us to this point in time and the, the following service uh, you'll remember it how you remember it, but I always do an evaluation of myself, no matter what I'm doing, whether I'm logging or riding bicycle or, or whatever I'm doing, I always evaluate my performance. So you'll remember Sunday night's uh, message, a beautiful sight or a beautiful vision, however you'll remember it. I remember it as the night because I remember my faults and failures more vividly than my successes. I guess in order that I might improve myself in whatever endeavor I'm engaged in, I remember Sunday night's service being entitled A Beautiful Sight, but what I remember about it is the night that I spoke too long, repeated myself too much, and embarrassed a young friend. So I have tried not to do that since, and I'll try not to do that in any way tonight. Uh, but anyhow, the second service, a beautiful sight, was, was to cause us to evaluate ourselves if our sight is beautiful. Our sight should be, and our goal should be, and our passion should be, and our desire should be, and our frequent prayer should be, that God, that our Lord would cause us to see the world and humanity around us through the eyes of Jesus. This was something that became a prayer of my own and a, and a pure and true desire of my heart. And God was kind enough to answer that prayer for me. And I can tell you that it has been more impactful on my life than anything that ever occurred to me in life short of the salvation of my soul. And uh, last night's title was Beautiful Worship. And our worship has gotten more beautiful each service, and it was beautiful to begin with. I mean, it has just been positively amazing, and I kind of beat it into the ground, and everybody really took it to heart. And I mean, our worship just got more beautiful every night, and it was beautiful to begin with. And, and you'll see that exemplified so much as, as uh, we sing our recurring anthem for these services at the end of the service, because... You know, it's just a little too much for me. I, you know, I just, I just leave all, I, I leave all go of myself, and I just, and I just praise and worship my Lord. And I used the example last night in the in the message of beautiful worship of an ancient church service from so long ago, uh, recorded in Nehemiah, how the people praised the Lord instantly as the book was opened, as the Bible, as the word was opened, they instantly lifted their hands and praised the Lord. And, and you know, the message was really to cause us to ex examine and evaluate ourselves. Uh, do, we, do we react to our Lord's goodness and his greatness and all that he's done for us and within us and, and his presence with us when we're gathered together? Do we react to uh, his spirit 
as we should, and I can say that I was not ashamed of anybody here any night. Our worship was positively beautiful, and, and you know, I can, I can honestly say I never experienced such beautiful worship uh, here in this place as we have this week, and I'm looking forward to more of it tonight and, and again once more tomorrow night. And tonight's message is entitled A Beautiful Heart. Each message is titled Beautiful. I didn't name them. The Lord did. If I had named them, uh, uh, they wouldn't be so beautiful, that's for sure and certain. Uh, and tonight's message is really caused, uh, or really meant to cause ourselves to examine ourselves personally as Christian individuals as to how the world sees us. We are to be Christ like. That is the very definition of Christian. And I had mentioned Sunday evening in my blooper service that I believe that the church and us as Christians individually fall far short of what we need to be or should be doing to reach the lost and the dying souls in the world, I believe the way that I put it was the lost and dying souls in the world around us, they're just really not buying what we're selling. And I said that in such a brash way, almost as if that was everybody else's problem and not mine as I've been imitating, doing my best effort to imitate a pastor this week, I guess I imitated that part of a pastor very well. They always act like they know everything. (laughs) Just teasing, pastor. But, in fact, it's something that I struggle with myself. And I think as we evaluate ourselves tonight on how the world and humanity around us see us as Christians and see us as the church, I think you'll have to agree that they're not necessarily buying what we're selling. I don't think anyone here tonight can name a time when they were standing in long lines to get in your church. And you can see here tonight that we have plenty of empty seating. And uh, what I'd like to bring to, to light this evening as I get into Scripture, which I'm going to do very soon, and I'll have to ask you to forgive me. Everything was relatively clear to me this morning about tonight's message, but uh, certain people in this in the congregation here tonight find this quite comical, but I am suffering from being awake past 8.30 at night too many nights in a row. (laughs) And, you know, I just, you know, everything works good when I don't get my sleep. I can log hard all day and the kids can't keep up. I can ride my bicycle and and, uh, you better be in fine condition to keep after me, but my mind just does not work well if I'm up past 8.30, and especially if I'm up past 8.30 too many nights. So as, as comical as I'm being and as humorous as this is to certain people, <laughs> I am being serious. Please forgive me. My mind is totally in a fog all day. The the things that I wanted to share with you tonight, they were so clear to me this morning. And when I came home from the woods and I looked at my notes, I'm like, what am I supposed to do with this? You know, just nothing really comes together and makes sense. But that's what this whole entire week has been about. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about any of us. If I accomplish anything or have, or will tonight, it's, it's only because of him. It's all about Jesus. It's not about me. I have, I have done other firsts this week. I have, uh, I have shared two messages in succession with little, very little notes. And in fact, last night, 
paid no attention to my notes at all. That's a first for me and certainly evidence that it's all about Jesus. It's not about me. He can accomplish what he will each and every night. I told the people in promotion to these services, it's not going to matter. God is going to do beautiful things in this place and it is going to go down in the history of St. Thomas Church has a time when God done something very beautiful and very special, and it has nothing to do with me. It's all about Jesus. It essentially would not matter if Donald Duck was standing up here tonight. So it's not going to matter if I fall asleep. It's going to be beautiful, I promise you, because it, it literally and truly has nothing to do with me. But tonight's message is entitled, A Beautiful Heart. And if you'll stand for the, in honor of the reading of God's Word and finding your Bibles, the Gospel of John chapter 4, I'm going to be speaking tonight from a very well-known story that you're all very familiar with. Uh, where Jesus interacted with the woman at the well. And when I think of the title of tonight's message, A Beautiful Heart, and I want to examine a person who had a beautiful heart, I certainly want to examine the life of Jesus Christ my Lord because never was there a heart more beautiful. And that's what we are going to do tonight. And we're just simply going to examine because what's so puzzling to me is that we are supposed to be Christ-like. But yet our interaction with people, especially with the lost and dying souls around us in the world, we're not near as good at it as he was. And I always question that. I always question as to why. Why can't I have that beautiful interaction to, with the lost and dying souls around me in the world to the extent that Jesus had? He left a mark on everybody that he came in contact with, and they never forgot him. And they accepted him and received him. And I really think... Uh, of all the areas that we covered uh, throughout these services, as all the, all the areas and aspects in our lives that we examined as to how perhaps we stand in the way of what Jesus would have us be and what Jesus would have us do, how we're often in our lives all about Jesus our way instead of just all about Jesus, this is the one that has always been most difficult for me to master, and I would have to say most difficult for the church to accomplish. The interaction that, that Jesus had with people and with the lost and dying souls in the world was positively astounding, and I personally fall far short of that. And I think I can speak for our church and, and, and pretty much a lot of churches. Uh, we fall very short of having that beautiful impact on the lost and dying souls in the world that Jesus was able to have. And uh, we're going to examine just how successful Jesus was at that in various places in Scripture. But uh, the main text for the message tonight will be uh, the Gospel of John chapter 4, and you can follow along as I read. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sichar, and near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus therefore being wearied with his journey sat thus 
on the well and it was about the sixth star, just a side note, that, that's something that always fascinated me, that God would leave the splendor and glories of heaven to come to this earth and suffer the many things that we suffer in this world. He grew weary, he got tired, he thirsted, he hungered. That's just a side note, nothing to do with uh, the message tonight. But that always was something that fascinated me. Now Jacob's well was there and Jesus was tired from his journey and he sat on the well and it was about the sixth hour of the day and there came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, give me to drink for his disciples were going away onto the city to buy meat. Then said the woman of Samaria unto him, how is it that thou being a Jew askest drink of me which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman said unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drink thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him, I shall give him, shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands. And he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that saidst thou truly. The woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. And upon this came his disciples, and they marveled that he talked with this woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and said to the men, Come and see a man which told me all things that ever I did is not this the Christ. Kind, gracious, loving Heavenly Father, more even than the other nights, I need your help, dear Lord. I can accomplish nothing with everlasting meaning of myself, that's for sure and certain. I need the blessing of your Holy Spirit's anointing, dear Lord. Just pour it out upon me tonight, Heavenly Father, that I might raise to light and bring to our attention and our examination the things that that you would have for us to evaluate in our lives tonight that we might uh, be a people that is better able to serve thee. And I thank you for these that you've given me this time to share together with tonight, dear Lord. They're precious to me, every one of them, because they are my fellow uh, believers in Christ Jesus, my Lord. They're my family. We are one in you. And I just thank you for them, everyone, tonight, Lord, and and, uh, that they were able to come out tonight. And I pray that you'll bless our time together together, dear Lord, and I pray that you'll give them a a ten of hearts, dear Lord, and that you'll pour out your revelating spirit upon them, dear Lord, that somehow through my stammering tongue they might receive deep in their hearts the things that you have for them to receive tonight, dear Lord, because if it lodges deep in our hearts, then Lord, we can carry it with us through those doors as we exit this place, that it might be demonstrated in our lives to the lost and dying souls around us in the world. Lord, 
Lord, I just thank you again tonight for this time that we're about to enjoy together. I thank you for your word once more powerful and precious and true and useful more today than ever before. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Gather my thoughts a moment from my tired mind. It's always fascinated me the effect that Jesus had on everybody that he came in contact with. And not only is that fascinating in and of itself, what heightens my fascination about that reality is he lives in us. His spirit is alive and real within us, and we are to be his representation to the world. As I mentioned earlier, we are titled Christians, and we are not Christians by title just because we choose the title. We are Christians because Jesus Christ, his spirit lives and dwells alive and real within us. Yet we struggle, I do personally, evaluate yourself, I won't point fingers and name names, I struggle with being the remarkable beacon of shining light to the lost and dying souls in the world around me, and certainly don't even measure up slightly to the remarkable way that Jesus was able to interact with people that needed him. And we are surrounded in life by people that need the Lord. And we are to be like him, so we are to leave a mark on them. It's very easy for us to leave a mark on people around us. Sadly, it's not always a good one. The fascinating part was Jesus always left a beautiful mark on everybody that he came in contact with. I mean, it's just mind-boggling to me if you even think about the story that we just examined here. You know, how Jesus held this woman's attention from the beginning to the end of their time together, and she was so enamored by Jesus that she left the well. Now, gathering or collecting water in that day was a pretty important thing that needed to be done. And she was so enamored by Jesus that she left her water pot to go and tell others about him. And it's just always fascinated me the interaction that Jesus had with people and how I fall so far short of that beautiful and lasting impression that he left on people that needed him. Another thing that's always been fascinating to me, and this is something that has really become a reality in my life, I've, I've conquered this part. I've gotten this part of Jesus' goodness and greatness. As I told everybody here in the first service that I truly and honestly, about a year, or year and a half ago, I made it my passion and my desire and my frequent prayer that the Lord would help me see humanity and the world around me through his eyes. And he has blessed me with answer to that prayer, and I mean it has been a, a stark contrast as to how I see humanity and the world around me through Christ's eyes as compared to how i seen it all of my life through Pete's eyes. And, you know, I just can't, I, I, you know, I don't want to, uh, be repetitive, and I don't want to get too long, and I don't want to cover material that I've already covered, but not all of you were here. I mean, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't have enough time to express to you 
the stark contrast between seeing the world and humanity around you through Christ's eyes compared to how I've seen it. And this is the part of, of Jesus' interaction with, with people that used to be so fascinating to me, but I really get it now. And I, I would like to get the rest of it where, where people are just drawn to me and people are just drawn to us because Christ lives within us. People are drawn to us because... Uh, uh, they're not beating the doors down to get in our church. So when we're out there in the world, we're, we're, we're as close to Jesus as they're going to get. They're not coming in here uh, to get him. And that is a, an issue that the church certainly needs to address as well. But I'm speaking about us individually. The part of Jesus that used to be so fascinating to me that I really get now is his compassion for humanity. If I go back, you don't need to go with me to Matthew chapter 9 and read for you verses 35 through 38. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. This is something that has become a stark reality to me and a real burden on my heart. I used to be able to be out in the world and be literally calloused to the lost and dying souls around me. And that's something we certainly all need to address in our lives if that's the case with you. You must evaluate yourself. I will not judge you. But I was that way. I was calloused to the lost and dying souls in the world around me. In fact, it was easier for me to be condemning and judgmental towards them in the sense that I would say to myself, they're going to be sorry for the way, they, the way that they're living. And I could say it in a calloused manner without any sadness. And I can't do it anymore. I just can't do it anymore. I understand Jesus' compassion. And I see a, a, a world of lost and dying souls around me. And I, I just want them to know Jesus. I understand the compassion of Christ and that's a step in the right direction. And I'm glad that the Lord gave me that beautiful vision that I spoke of, that beautiful sight that I spoke of that the Apostle Paul got in contrast to the man that was Saul of Tarsus. I'm glad that I got that part of it, but I have so much more work to do. How, how, how did Jesus accomplish what he accomplished with everybody that he encountered in life. They were so fascinated with him. They were enamored by him. The woman left her, her chore of gathering water to run and tell others about him. And all he did was sit and spoke with them. What did, he, what did people see in Jesus that they need to see in us? Where are we falling short? Where are we failing? Why are people not enamored by us? Because Jesus is alive and real in us why are people not fascinated by us because when they see us they see Jesus and I'm not going to tell you I have an answer to that I'm asking you and I'm asking you to evaluate yourself how in what ways Say it along with me. I'll say it about myself. How and what ways, Pete Carnahan, are you standing in the way of Jesus 
and what he would like to do in you and with you and through you to reach the lost and dying souls in the world around you. I, 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 I've been given this compassion that Christ felt when he seen uh, the multitudes and he seen that they were as sheep without a shepherd. I, I, I really get that now. And I, I can't help but think uh, of... the school board meetings at Sealands Grove where we discussed the transgender issues. And uh, those transgenders came to state their case and defend themselves on the issue of open bathroom use for either sex. They came from all over from Philadelphia. They came from everywhere. Not only did they come from all over, they did a, did a much better job as far as numbers were concerned at representing their side than the Christians did. We were sorely outnumbered. And I can't help but think in those meetings how well-meaning Christians from churches all around our locality took that podium to state their case against this open use of bathrooms because of the transgenders that were uncertain of their identity or, or unsatisfied with their identity and wanted the, the privilege to use the bathroom of, what, of the sex that they identified with rather than the sex they were born. And those transgenders stated their case quite profoundly and, and in large numbers and they were well prepared and uh, I would have to say that they were not necessarily kind towards us. But should we not have been towards them? Evaluate yourself. Should we not have been towards them? I think of so many of Jesus' stories in the Bible and his interaction with people. I think of uh, his interaction with the harlot that the religious leaders brought to him to be stoned uh, because of, of her profession and being caught in the act of it. And I think of how Jesus stooped on the ground and he wrote and he stooped on the ground and he wrote and each time he looked up, uh, less of her accusers were there until there were none left. And I think of how Jesus looked at this woman who uh, certainly was condemned and judged by those that accused her. And when Jesus looked up and saw that none of her accusers were there, he said to her, woman, where are thine accusers? And she said, there are none, Lord. And he said to her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. I think of that story and that interaction Jesus had with, with this sinful person. And I wonder perhaps if we fall short in that area. Are we too condemning and too judgmental? I always felt like the church is. I've always felt like Christians are. I never can find a case in God's word where Jesus was condemning and judgmental to those that needed him most. His reaction, his response was, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. But he had a remarkable knack. He just had a remarkable knack that we just don't have. We just don't have as Christians and we don't have as the, as the church at reaching people that needed him most. And I want that. I want that as badly as I want the compassion that he's given me for the lost and dying souls in the world, but I just, I, I just, I'm not good at it. I don't know how to do it. Going back to those meetings, at those school board meetings, uh, meaningful after meaningful after meaningful Christian took that podium and they condemned and they judged those transgenders just as harshly 
as they could and increased their anger and increased their resentment towards church and all things Christian. And I can't think of a case where Jesus did that. What Jesus did was simply this. You can examine case after case after case. He was compassionate towards them. He met their needs in various ways. He met their needs physically, and he met their needs spiritually. And the thing that's so remarkable about how Jesus operated and how he interacted with people is that He often met their physical needs first. Before he ever began to address their spiritual needs. And I wonder if we fall short in that way. I wonder if we immediately jump on the, you need Christ and you're a sinner and you're bound for hell. I wonder, you know, if we kind of jump on that a little too quick sometimes. If you look how Jesus often operated, he, he, he often did things differently than, than we tend to do and differently than the way we think. You know, he so often met physical needs first. Uh, the scripture that I meant to, to share that, that expresses that is Matthew 14, verses 13 through 16. When Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion. And before he went about telling them that they're all sinners lost and bound for hell, before he got to addressing their spiritual need, he was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came and said, this is a desert place and times past. We've got to send these people away that they can go into the villages and buy victuals. And Jesus said unto them, no, no, no. Uh, they don't have to depart. I'm going to meet more of their physical needs. And then the story goes on, of course, of how he fed the 5,000. This was quite a multitude of people with five loaves of, of or fish, or a small amount of food. But anyhow, you know, uh, that's one thing that I've always noticed about Jesus' interaction with people. And I wonder if, if perhaps we do poorly at leaving a beautiful mark on people in that respect, you know. Uh, shouldn't we show concern for them and, and what they might need and what their needs are before we just start stomping the Bible and shoving it down their throat. That certainly worked for Jesus in many instances. And I heard, I heard a message that I can't help but think I heard just for this night as I'm standing before you speaking now. I just heard it the beginning of this week. I believe it was uh, Andrew Womack uh, was sharing the message. And uh, he told a story of how he was telling the story secondhand, another minister of the gospel, how he led someone to Christ in the exact kind of opposite way of we tend to think we have to do it. He knew of this couple that were living together in sin. They were not married. They were just living together. They were in his community, and uh, they, were, they were believed to have drug issues, and, and uh, they seemed to be poor folks. And this man just took it upon himself to knock on their door one day and ask them, these complete strangers, this man... Uh, just took it upon himself to, uh, whether he was doing it experimentally or, or what prompted him to do this, he just asked this strange couple if they had any needs that he could help them with. And a gentleman that looked quite rough 
and had answered the door, said, yeah, I don't have a job. I could use some food and I'm all messed up on drugs. I could use some more, some more of them. And, and, you know, he just went, you know, he was kind of being a smart aleck, like he didn't believe this man was really interested in his needs. But he found out very directly that this man was quite interested in his needs and this man got him food and this man spent time with him and this man asked him if there was any, any needs that he, could, that he could pray for him about. And this had a, a phenomenal and remarkable and beautiful and enamoring impact on these people that needed Christ so bad. And this man continued to have a relationship with them. He established a relationship with them. And he returned to their home again and again. And he brought them food and he helped them with needs. And, and he, he, he had prayer with them. And these people just took it all in. They soaked it up like a sponge, like the woman at the well. She was just enamored by Jesus. And... and uh, and, and that's how people were uh, here in Matthew where we examined, you know, they were enamored by him because, you know, uh, he just started addressing their needs. He, he healed their sick and, and, and uh, you know, he just was compassionate towards them. He was moved with compassion towards them. And as the story goes, as the story was told, this man got so far, his relationship with these godless people developed to the point where they would sit and listened to him while, while he read scripture to them. He attended to their physical needs first, as we've seen Jesus do here in the, the story of Matthew. And he met their needs, and he showed love, and he showed care, and he showed compassion to them. And they became open to prayer, and they became open to the gospel. And time went on to where these people who knew nothing of, of the word, who knew nothing about Jesus, or knew nothing about religion or cared, they became enamored with this man because of his love and care and compassion towards them. And he would actually have Bible study with these people that knew nothing of God's word, and they were just riveted to every word that he said. And one particular day, he was reading the story about the prodigal son. And at the end of that, uh, getting close to the end of the story, he asked this man, this non-believer, this man that needed uh, Christ in his life, he said to him, what do you think the father done when that son returned home? And the man, of course, said, Obviously, he didn't treat him very well. He sent him down the road for sure and certain because he took his, his wealth that his father had, had given him, his inheritance, and he squandered it, and he did this and that. And the man just went on and on how this father surely just raked that son over the coal and sent him down the road with his tail between his legs. And then the man went on to explain how he took him in. And he put on his finest coat on that son and he wrapped his arms around him and he loved him. And he took him back into his home, not as a servant, but at his, as his beloved son again. And then he said to this gentleman that needed Christ so badly in his life, that story, the father is to represent God and the son is to represent those that need him. And that man jumped to his feet and he said, do you mean to tell me that God would treat me in that same fashion in spite of the way that I have lived all of my life? And he said, yes, he most certainly would. And the man fell to his knees and he accepted the Lord and his girlfriend with him. And it didn't take long until he realized that we are living in sin. And, and he, he married that girl that was his girlfriend. And you know how a lot of these stories go. They're in the ministry today. And they're reaching people for Christ. And I'm quite certain that they're not stomping the Bible and shoving it down people's throats first. I'm quite certain that they're reaching out to people with love and compassion and, and being concerned about their needs and helping them meet their needs first. And then second, it's always fascinated me how 
Seconds always follow first. How did I say this? I have it written somewhere if I can find it. Jesus met people's here and now needs. Their physical needs he often met first in order to open the door to meeting their spiritual needs. First always leads to what is second. And Jesus always seemed to know the difference between the two as we should And Jesus left the beautiful and he left the lasting and he left the memorable mark on everyone he came in contact with except those who were most religious. His only harsh words, as it's recorded for us, were for those most religious. The scribes and the Pharisees, he had harsh words for them, but he never did for those that needed him. And going back to the school board meeting, uh, I heard some good and powerful sermons from that podium. And I had no argument with any of them. But as that was what was needed at that time and in that place. And is that perhaps one of the reasons that we're not successful at reaching the lost and dying souls around us. Do we get it backwards sometime? I can tell you this, because God blessed me with that vision of seeing the world and humanity through Christ's eyes, I can tell you this, and I say it with shame. In my Christian brethren, I don't say it with pride, and I don't say it to boast. I say it with sadness and shame because I fall short. And we all fall short. Examine yourselves, Christian individuals. Examine yourself, church. We fall short at reaching the lost and dying souls around us. We just have trouble getting it right. Jesus didn't. They were all enamored by him and he reached them spiritually. And if he ever failed to, it's not recorded for us. He reached them. And we fall short. And getting back to that meeting, I don't say this boastfully. I say it with sadness and I say it with shame. That auditorium was full. And this is as true as I'm standing before you. I'm the only person in that place that showed them transgender people love and kindness because I had a compassion for them. I just, as much as I despised their sin, I despised it as powerfully as I despised my own. I just wanted to wrap my arms around every one of them and just tell them about Jesus. But there is where it stops. I have the compassion, but I fell short there. I showed them love. I showed them kindness. I opened doors for them. I spoke to them politely while they were blatantly ignored by every other person in that auditorium. But that's as far as I got. That's as close as I get. What was it about Jesus that enabled him to reach others for Christ that we're not getting? What was it about Jesus that I'm not getting? I'm not standing up here tonight imitating a preacher that knows it all and can tell you I don't know. I just don't know. All I know is I want to reach them. I have a compassion for the lost and dying souls in the world around me that won't go away because God answered a prayer that enabled me to see the world and humanity around me the way that Jesus seen it. That's what Jesus seen. He seen them as sheep without a shepherd. He seen them as as people that he just wanted to love. He just wanted to wrap his arms around them and he just wanted to make them know him. And we should be doing that. And I can't stand here and tell you how. And I can't stand here and tell you why we're not successful at it like Jesus is. When we are his representatives, we are to be Christ-like. I understand that we can't be Jesus. I understand that the Christian, the definition of Christian is to be Christ-like. 
And I'm not condemning anybody in this place or the church that I love so dearly. I understand that we're not Jesus, but we're not doing all that we could or should to be Christ-like, to reach the lost and dying souls around us. And, you know, I don't even know uh, how to end this all up. The title of the message was A Beautiful Heart. You know, we began with, you know, with a beautiful journey and a beautiful sight and, and, and uh, beautiful worship. And, you know, we, we, we get it all. We kind of absorbed it all. We kind of all were able to say, yeah, you're, you know, that's true about me. That's true about me. I get in Jesus' way in, 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 these, in, these, ish, in these things that we examined in the previous messages. But here tonight, I just don't know. I just, this is something I could never get a handle on and something that we really fall short in and something that we certainly need to pray about. You know, I mean, maybe we can never get to a place where the lost and dying souls in the world are beating on our doors to get in and fill these pews. Maybe we can never get there. I don't know. But I do know this. Even with a burning compassion for the lost and dying souls in the world around me, the best I could do is show love and kindness. And my colleagues were unable to even do that. So I would have to say I fall short. And I would have to say we fall short. And I would have to say examine yourself with me as I examine myself. And let this be something that we're praying about. And let this be something that we're addressing in our personal lives and in our church. Because these services really as the Lord laid them on my heart were really designed and really meant for us to evaluate ourselves so that we might be not what we are and always have been in Christ, but that God would care, that Jesus would take us past where we are and what we've been in Christ, take us out of and beyond ourselves to what he would like us to be. So as much as I like to imitate that preacher that really knows what he's talking about and really has an answer for the issues that he's addressing in his message, I, I, I can't imitate that preacher tonight. All I can say is I'm asking you to evaluate yourselves. What is it that, what is it that humanity saw in Jesus that they were so enamored by him I believe or I feel that they just really saw in him a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful heart. And we need to work at getting that beautiful, beautiful heart. We need to work at having that beautiful heart that people seen when they interacted with Jesus and were so enamored by him. Uh, I have to be careful Tomorrow's night's message takes us beyond this point. It's similar to tonight's, but even so much better. I mean, you know, to me, as I evaluate my performance as imitating a pastor this week, to me, I'm already feeling like this was the blooper night that out bloopered Sunday night. But, you know, that's just me. I never feel like I do anything well. And, you know, and I'm, I'm not sure that I'm ending this up the way that I meant for it to end. And, you know, my mind's been foggy and scattered. Uh, you know, the 8.30, it's bedtime thing. I got five minutes. Uh, you know, I, I hope you all got something from what I shared with you tonight. I certainly don't feel like uh, I measured up to the task. I hope the Lord was able to bring you something through my stumbling and stammering way. Uh, I will do this. I, I have, uh, we in fact began this service in a very unusual way. We began our revival services in uh, repentance. Somewhere I had heard in a message, 
right before these services started, such a beautiful sermon on how revival begins with repentance. And since everything about this revival service was going to be unusual from the beauty of it, from the Lord using a dummy like me to imitate a pastor, and you know everything about it was unusual, I went ahead and made that unusual as well. We began our, older, our revival services with an older call. And, uh, and, you know, people responded and, and it, just was, it just was beautiful, you know. People responded to, yeah, yeah, me too. I've, I've done, I, I have not done all that I should have so that the Lord and so that my pastor could accomplish great things in me. I have stood in the way. And that was the, the sense of that older service. And I'm, I'm not necessarily going to have an older service tonight. And I even feel kind of awkward about it in any sense as I am not an ordained minister. But I'm going to ask you tonight to truly evaluate your lives personally and evaluate uh, the church that you attend and belong to and evaluate the church as a whole worldwide. Uh, why do we fall so short? at reaching the lost and dying souls around us. Why can't we have that beautiful interaction like Jesus had with those that need him? And it's something that I fall short of. And if you'll bow your heads, everyone, and close your eyes. Mine are closed too. I don't need to see, but I can tell you this. I'm not ashamed for you to know. I'm going to raise my hand and say, Lord, I fall short in this area. I really need help in this area. Lord, you've, you've given me a compassion and a desire for the lost and dying souls around me that just it just wrenches and breaks my heart, Lord. But I am certainly far from successful at reaching them as you were, Lord. And I'm not even sure. I just, I just brought to light for us to think about tonight certain things that it might be. Do we get it? Do we get it? Do we do, we do what's, what's first when we're supposed to be doing what's normally second? Or, or what is it, Lord? I'm not the one with the answers. I'm seeking them from you, Lord. And I'm raising my hands. I'm raising them both and I'm waving them. I don't want you to miss it, Lord. I want this in my life. And if there's anybody here, Lord, that feels that they fall short individually in in being that enamored, enamoring person that we need to be, that you were Jesus to those that you encountered in life and, and needed you in their life, Lord, I fall way short of that. And if there's anybody else here that can say that about themselves, I want your help, Lord. If anyone else can say it, get your hands in the air. I'm not looking, every eye's closed, but the Lord sees. I, I, this is an area that, that ha, uh, we definitely uh, get in the way of Jesus in our lives and this is an area that we definitely get in the way of Jesus in our church they're not beating down our doors and we're not winning souls to Christ even when we have a true and honest and sin sincere compassion for them as I had at that meeting for those transgender persons there's just no way for me to, to describe to you how bad how bad I wanted them to know Jesus and how horrible I felt for them to be so messed up and so disturbed in life and not know somebody that could make it all so beautiful and I didn't know how to reach them. I didn't know how to be that person that Jesus is that leaves a lasting and a beautiful mark on them that they leave what they're doing, whatever they're doing and they go and tell everybody about this man that told me everything I ever did. I just want to know how Lord as a Christian I can, I can be what you were as you interacted with people around you in the world that needed Christ in their heart and in their lives. I just want that, Lord, and I just feel that I fall way short of that, Lord, and I want you to look at the hands I trust and, and hope that there's many of them raised, Lord, that we can accomplish that in our, in our Christian individual lives, and we can accomplish that in our church, the individual churches that we go to and belong to, Lord, and that we can accomplish that as 
a church worldwide, Lord, just help us, Heavenly Father. I don't have the answers, and somehow you couldn't give them to me to share. But I know that it's a problem we have, dear Lord. It's just another way that we're all about Jesus. We have a passion for the lost and dying souls, at least of us all on one level, maybe some greater than another. But we care about them, Lord, because we know of you and we know of your goodness and your greatness and your kindness and your love and your life real and alive in us and we all have a passion on some level for the lost and dying souls around us in the world but yet we fall short Lord help us to reach them the way that you were so successful at reaching them Lord whatever the key is whatever the pattern is Lord we need your help individually and as the church and and I thank you Lord for each one that it was willing to admit tonight that this is a, a problem that they battle with as well, Lord, and I pray that you'll help us, Heavenly Father, not just to uh, not just to be words that we heard in the prayer that we said, Lord, but that you will truly help us to make this an issue that we address in our lives, and I thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.